In this tutorial, I'm gonna teach you what are the strategies that you need to follow in order to achieve effective configuration for your microservices. We looked at the Spring Cloud Config Server and how we can have it talk to a Git repo and have that update information, update configuration changes in real time. Is that something you wanna use all the time? Or are there other options? Should you be looking at some other options? I'll walk you through what are the strategies that you would typically adopt and what is usually recommended as best practice. Okay, we've looked at a bunch of different ways in which you can store configuration in application property files, in profiles, in external config server, a whole lot of stuff here. So the obvious question is when to use what? Configuration is one of those things which is kind of obvious for the most part, so you kind of know where something should go. But in this tutorial, I'm gonna just highlight a couple of strategies, couple of kind of guidelines to get you started. Again, a lot of these are pretty much obvious, but I just wanna cover it so that you know, and it is in the back of your mind when you're making these decisions about what configuration goes where. The first thing I'm gonna tackle is, if you look at a configuration, try and see what the specificity of that configuration is and how likely it is to change. So here's an example, right? So you have configuration, which is very much microservice specific, and then it's not likely to change a lot. Let's say you have a microservice, which is, uh, it has a certain name, or it is something that's used for the internal workings of the microservice, and you're never gonna be touching that in your application. So it's very likely that you would wanna put the configuration in a property file. You know that the application is gonna be using it, but this is not something that you would wanna expose as something that you know can be changed at runtime. Well, property file is a good place to put it. Put it in the property file, give it an intelligent default, check it and build it into the jar and you don't have to worry about it. Anytime there is a change, it is, since it's closely tied to the inner workings of the microservice, since it's closely tied to the functionality, the cost of making a change in the code and deploying it isn't much because it's very likely gonna require changes to the code itself, which consumes that microservice, okay? Uh, to contrast, if it's a, something that's microservice specific, but then it is likely to change often, well, then you put it in a config server, right? You, this is an external configuration API, right? You wanna make changes to it and affect the behavior of a microservice, then you put this in a config server. You might ask, well, if I put something in a property file and I'm looking at it as a configuration, there is no distinction per se. You can put something in a property file and then change it later using the config server. Well, the answer is yes. But then there is this implicit understanding of some configuration being kind of like an API, right? Something that is meant to be changed at runtime versus something that is not meant to be changed at runtime. So you might have 100 different properties in your property file, but not all of them are meant to be changed using a config server. So it is about you mentally drawing that line, drawing that separation and say, okay, these kind of property files, even though Spring provides me the ability to configure any of them at runtime, these are property files which are kind of internal and I don't wanna touch them during runtime versus these configuration properties which are likely to change, which are things you want to change, and as a result of which, they should be in a config server. Okay, that's where you draw that distinction. You draw that line there. Uh, there are a bunch of properties which are very likely to be used if you're using a cloud provider. Let's say you deploy to AWS or Heroku or Azure. The way these providers give you environment-specific configuration is using path variables and system variables. Okay, so you have system variables that these cloud providers set in the system where your application is gonna run. So when you have those things, well, we've looked at how Spring can leverage those system variables by just directly using those variables in your property file, right? And by directly using those variables in your in your code even, using the at value annotation. So that is possible, but then what I've found to be a good practice is to use some kind of a reader. Let me illustrate what I mean. So let's say, uh, let's take this example, right? We've already used this in our code. We've looked at the home location, which is a system property, and we have used that in our spring property, which is fine. This is how you would use it. But then we wanna have some kind of an alias to abstract any hosting provider configuration. So for example, let's say your host exposes the port, right? Using host.environment.port, just a random property name that I came up with, right? 
This obviously varies from provider to provider. You deploy on AWS, it's going to be something else. You deploy on Azure, it's going to be something else. So the recommendation is to use something like this. You have this alias env.port, which is referring to that system variable. And once you have this alias, anytime you want to use that variable, you use that alias instead of using this thing directly. Okay. This is useful for a couple of reasons. One, if you want to move from, you know, uh, provider to provider, let's say you want to move from AWS to Azure. Well, then there's just one place where you need to update all these provider specific properties and then everything else is kind of implied. The second benefit is that it's readable and it's consistent across different instances. So you might have a situation where you have some microservices in your in your company running on AWS, some other microservices running on Azure. This provides like a company-wide convention that is useful and consistent across different microservice hosts. It's not a big deal, but this is something that I've seen people use. So it's kind of useful to have that alias so that your main code doesn't have any of your provider-specific stuff or as little of your provider-specific stuff as possible. So here's an example of me using a system variable directly in the config properties. So whenever you have these kind of environment configuration that these providers expose as, as system variables, well, you can directly use them as system variables and not have it be something that you specify in properties for obvious reasons. Another common question that I get asked is related to security of your configuration. How do you secure your Spring Cloud Config Server, right? Uh, a lot of people think about securing Git. They say, okay, do you want to keep a Git repo as a secure repo and require authentication for somebody to access the repo? It usually doesn't work that way. Typically, when it comes to securing this, there are two ways to approach this. First, you secure your Spring Cloud Config Server itself by using Spring Security. Okay, Spring Security is something that you can throw into any Spring Boot project and you can configure it to do basic authentication. It can be something more elaborate, however you want to deal with it, right? You make your Spring Cloud Config Server secure so that only authorized microservices can access it, okay? That's the first thing. The second thing, which is probably the subsequent question that people are going to ask is, well, you can configure Spring Cloud Config Server, but what about Git? Let's say you have some secure information that you want to, you know, uh, retrieve as config. Okay, let's say credentials, database properties, all that kind of stuff. Do you want to expose that in Git, right? So anybody who has access to the repo can look at those values. Even if you make your repo secure, you really don't want to have passwords and credentials saved in plain text, right? So in order to solve this problem, we use encryption. Okay, you encrypt anything that's secure that you want to retrieve from Spring Cloud Config Server, but you're not going to save the plain text values in Git. You're going to be encrypting it. Okay, so here's how this works. Say you have some credentials or connection strings or API keys. There are a bunch of such use cases where you don't want to save those values in a plain text file and check it into a Git repo. What you're going to do is you're going to save the encrypted value in your application.yaml or whatever property file you have, okay? So when you open the Git repo, when you open the file in the Git repo, it's probably gonna look something like this. So you have this special keyword called cipher in curly braces, which starts out the value. And then after that, you have a bunch of gobbledygook, right? It's not something that will make sense because this is actually encrypted. Now, how is it gonna get decrypted? And how was it encrypted in the first place? So the way this works is Spring Cloud Config Server has the ability to encrypt and decrypt keys. So let's say you have connection string that you want to encrypt. So you use Spring Cloud Config Server to encrypt it, get the encrypted value, and save that into the Git repo. When somebody is retrieving this value, what Spring Cloud Config Server is going to do is it's going to look up the value it's going to detect, okay, this is a cipher value. Okay, so this is encrypted. I need to decrypt it. So when Spring Cloud Config Server is returning that value to the consumer, the microservice, the client, which is calling it, when it's returning that value, it is going to decrypt that value and send it back. So what we've achieved here is data in its resting state in the Git repo, right? The value in the resting state when it's saved in the Git repo 
is not visible in plain text format, right? It is encrypted. It's only when it's being accessed that it's going to get decrypted. Okay, this makes it a little bit more secure. I'm not going to go into the details of how you do this. I'm going to link to a documentation page which explains this in a lot of detail if you want to actually do it for your applications. But basically, this works with JCE, okay? So it's JVM where Spring Cloud Configs server is running needs to have this particular extension, the Java crypt cryptography extension called JCE, which is responsible for encrypting and decrypting, okay? This is the responsibility of Spring Cloud Config server. So when you're checking in your secure keys in your Git repo, you don't want to save it as plain text. You encrypt it using Spring Cloud Config Server and save the encrypted value in your Git repo. Another common practice is to use intelligent defaults for local development so that you make the local development process easy. It's so easy to get caught up in like, okay, this is how I want my microservice to work in when deployed on a cloud provider. But then what happens when you're checking out the code and running it locally? You don't want to be doing 10 different things to get it to work. So use intelligent defaults. There are a bunch of ways in which you can do this. So for example, we have something like this, right? Config URI is your property, which is referring to maybe some system variable, config.port. It is easy to set the system variable and then use it, but then people need to know that that needs to be done. And you have to say, okay, in order for me to check out my microservice and run it, you have to do these 10 different things. And that kind of adds to the effort and adds to the friction for somebody getting productive with your code. So a good way to do this is to provide your default right there. We've seen how you can provide a default by using the colon uh, syntax inside this dollar and curly brace. When you have a dollar curly brace and you're looking up a property, you can use the colon and then specify the default if this property is not found. Okay, so this is a very good way to do this so that your code can run without a whole lot of property dependencies. You don't want to be having a whole lot of dependencies in your code. So this is one way to do it. And finally, I want you to look up this website called 12factor.net. Okay, so this is a description of a 12-factor app. This is a very good description of what we should aim for our microservices to be. It lists out a bunch of different criteria and how your microservice should adhere to these criteria for, for best results, right? These are This is the wisdom that's been distilled from a lot of people creating a lot of microservices this way. So here, there is this section called config, okay? So this is super helpful to kind of understand what we need for our configuration to be, what we want our microservices to be in terms of configuration, what's the bar that it needs to meet. And uh, here we see a bunch of stuff that we've already seen, strict separation of config from code. A lot of what we've covered in this course should look familiar here, but this is also a good reference for you to look up when you're trying to see what's the best way to design your configuration. Again, there should be nothing surprising here, uh, just a point of reference when, you're, when you have questions about configuration in your microservices. With this, we are close to wrapping up this series. In the next tutorial, we will conclude this course by doing a quick recap and some further exploration items for you to consider. See you in the next tutorial.